As some of you may know, in addition to miniature painting, I am a huge Nintendo fan. And because of this, I just couldn't resist making my Tyranid color scheme based on Bowser's hot new look in his brand new solo outing, Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. It was such a good fit, I just had to do it. This scheme may look complicated, but it's actually a very quick and simple process that I've designed for speed painting large armies like Tyranids. With a little bit of patience and a few simple tools, most of which you already have if you're following along with my Hobby Basics series, you too should be able to paint Hive Fleet Bowser's Fury. To begin, we're going to want to prime our Tyranids using a matte black primer. I'm using my airbrush for this task because of the frigid Canadian winter, but feel free to use a spray can for this instead, either way it's basically the same result. Once the primer has had time to fully dry, we're going to give the model some basic highlights using a blue-gray color. To get the color we're looking for, I'm using two drops of black-gray and one drop of blue-green on my palette and mixing it together very well. Once it's mixed, I'm going to use my Army Painter Medium Dry Brush, although any sort of wide flat brush would do fine, to take just a little bit of paint on our bristles and then rub our brush on our paper towel back and forth to get rid of most of the paint. Our goal being to remove almost all of the paint from our brush. To test if we have the right amount, we can use our thumb as a test model. This is too much, so I rubbed off more of it, and finally, this is about the right amount that you want for dry brushing. Then, with just a little bit of paint on our brush, we're going to dry brush the entire model, letting the paint catch on just the sharpest and most raised surfaces to create some nice natural highlights. We can continue to do this using successive coats of dry brushing, putting more paint on our brush when necessary until we have a nice subtle highlight that looks something like this. Once that's done, we can add one further level of successive highlights to the figure by using pure blue-green, mixed with a single drop of glaze medium just to help it flow a little bit better. Once the color is mixed, we can take just a bit of the color on our brush, wipe off most of it on our paper towel, and then use just the side of the brush to gently add some selective highlights to the black armor of the character. Not highlighting the entire thing with this color, but just catching a few of the most raised edges of it to show how light plays over a glossy black surface. For an example of the light treatment we're going for, we can just take a look at the reference art that we are basing this figure on, and it shows us a good example of what we're going for. Next, we're going to use a mixture of one drop pale sand and one drop glaze medium to highlight the glowy fire parts of the model. My reason for this is that we want the glowing orange parts to feel very vibrant, so undercoating them with an off-white color is going to help them look nice and bright later on. To tell which parts of the model we want to glow, we are going to roughly follow the guidelines of how Bowser looks in his fury mode but take a little bit of artistic license to help translate that color scheme to a Tyranid. Here you can see I'm painting all of the vents, as well as the eyes, and all of the weird exposed creases that these Tyranids tend to have. Don't worry about being too precise with this right now, we'll clean up any excess white paint later. Next, we're going to highlight the glowing armor plates. On Fury Bowser, both his hair and the tips of his turtle shell are glowing. The closest thing the Tyranids have to hair is their head crest, so we're going to paint it to glow in a similar way to Bowser's hair, with the crest glowing the most and it receding towards the back of the back armor, glowing less and less as it gets towards the tail of the model. As we apply this underglow, we're making sure to leave lots of shadows between the individual plates on the Tyranid. You can see here I'm doing a little bit of simple blending in order to create a light gradient from white to black. First laying down the highlight on the most bright and raised portion of the shell, and then going back in with a second light coat of transparent paint to help blend it together. If you end up going a bit too far with the highlight like I did here, don't worry too much about it. You can always take some black paint and use it as a sort of eraser to reset your figure and try again. Finally, although Bowser's claws are not glowing in the key art, I thought I would take a little bit of artistic license here and have the Tyranid scythe arms be the same glowing orange as the rest of the figure. To finish up, I'm going to add just a little bit of a glow between the rib cage, just like how Bowser's belly has a little bit of a glow. With our underpainting complete, we can move on to adding the glow colors. 
When painting fire or lava, in order to make it look as vibrant as possible, I like to often mix my own colors instead of just using a bottle of red or orange paint. So in order to create the nice variants we see in Bowser's fire glow, we're going to use successive coats of magenta and yellow glazes to create a wide variety of red, yellow, and orange tones on the model. Starting with a magenta glaze of one drop warlock purple and two drops glaze medium mixed together with water, we're going to get some paint on our brush, touch the paper towel with it, and let the excess moisture remove itself. And then slowly, we're going to add a very thin glaze of magenta paint to almost all of the glowing parts of the model, just leaving some of the most raised surfaces as that pure white color. By using very thin glazes instead of solid colors, we're helping to preserve the brightness of our white underneath and create a much nicer glow effect than we would get from just using solid colors. Next, we're going to use Cassandor Yellow, which works nicely as a glaze right out of the pot, no thinning required, and apply it all over the white and magenta areas of the model. This will have the effect of turning all the white areas a bright yellow and all the magenta areas a rich orange or red, depending on how much magenta we use. Once we've applied this glaze to all the glowing areas, our models are now 80% done. Congratulations, you can stop here if you want. And for the last bit of this tutorial, we are just going to do a few more tweaks and details to help refine what we've already done. Once we finished the last step, I compared the model to the Bowser key art and realized that overall, I wanted the model to be a lot more orange and a lot less yellow. So I applied a few coats of magenta to selective parts of the model to help achieve this. I then realized what was really missing was the glow was too dark. So ignore what I just said about adding more magenta and instead add more and more white to the glowing parts of the model, especially that front crest. Halfway through, I realized it might be cool to add some patterning to the back of the model. So instead of highlighting it with an overall white, I used stippling to add some dots of white to the areas I wanted to be a little bit brighter. I also took this opportunity to clean up the teeth area a bit using some black paint to paint in the teeth and help define the eyes a little bit better. Finally, I'm adding yet another coat of yellow glaze to the model, but this time blending a little bit of the magenta glaze while the yellow glaze is still wet to do some rough wet blending and get a nice gradient effect. Once that's done, I added another coat of yellow glaze on top of the whole thing to erase any pinkness and bring the magenta back into a more orange red range. I then repeated this same process on the scythe arms, wet blending them until I got a look that I liked. Overall, I'm much happier with this refined glow and it looks a lot better to me. To finish up, we're going to add just a few final highlights to the black parts of the model using a mixture of one drop blue green, one drop pale sand, one drop black gray, and three drops of glaze medium mixed together with a wet brush. Using this thin down gray color, we're going to highlight just a few of the black parts on the model that I think would catch the most light, which are generally the edges of the model or the most raised parts. Once we're done with that, we can add a further final highlight to show that the model's carapace is quite shiny by adding dots of light with our off-white paint to various sharp edges of the carapace. This is a great way to make any surface look shiny or metallic just picking out a few areas and adding dots of pure white to it. Once this was done, I took a very, very thin down cyan glaze and applied it gently over some of these white dot areas to add a more gradual transition in the highlights. And overall, just a bit more contrast for the main orange color of the model. Once our painting is done, we can turn our attention to the model's base. One of the common issues with some of these Tyranid models is that they are top heavy, something I didn't fully realize until I had completely painted the model. So removing the model from the base, I tried to carve away the excess underneath the base so that I could glue a nickel to it to help counterbalance the weight. I kind of messed up this original base and ended up just going with a non slotta base from my collection so that I wouldn't have to carve anything away on it. Using super glue on this base, I glued the nickel to the base and then once that was dry, I used clippers to clip the model from its base and polystyrene cement to stick the model to the new base, leaning it up against a paint pot and letting it dry in that position overnight. Once the glue was dry, but before I added any basing material, I added an overall coat of gloss varnish to the model to get that alien xenomorph look. 
I diluted the varnish with about 50% water so it wouldn't be too strong. But after giving it some time to dry, I'm still not quite sure how I feel about the gloss varnish. Maybe next time I would just apply the gloss to the underside of the model and leave some of the orange parts with no gloss at all. In any case, now you can see what it would look like with gloss and no gloss and make your own decision as to how you want your tiernits to look. Finally, we'll use some Viejo Earth Texture Basing Paste to create a nice simple basing scheme for our tiernits that will be easy to replicate over our future swarm. Or, if you prefer, you could just use white craft glue and any sort of sand. I also added a few small rocks from my rock collection just to give the base a small amount of variety. After giving the basing paste at least 8 hours to dry, I gave the base a quick dry brush, first with parasite brown, and then with pale sand. Again, I'm not going for anything too fancy here, just something light that will contrast all the black on the tyranids and is easy to replicate over and over again. Finally, we can rim the base with a color of our choice, in my case, I'm using Parasite Brown again, and our figure is complete. Thank you so much for watching my tutorial on High Fleet Bowser's Fury. Although, in game, I'm probably going to end up calling it High Fleet Behemoth's Fury. Behemoth's Fury? Behemoth's Fury? I don't know how to pronounce that. And pretend that these are the strange, ghostly, spectral remains of the long-thought-dead High Fleet Behemoth, which I'm told is a real thing in the Warhammer space lore. But as always, it's up to you how you want to use these techniques or paint your Tyranids. Before we go, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to all of our supporters over on Patreon. You are the reason this channel is still going, so thank you very much for your support. This week, I'd especially like to thank Theseus and wish a very, very happy birthday to Fly from your friend, Franz. If you'd like to get access to bonus content or see your name up here, you can subscribe over at patreon.com slash Dana Howell. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.